So all eyes are on the future of our democracy. And as the clock ticks out for the People's Act, we got to act and we got to keep the pressure on because, you know, even the latest breaking news that the Trump administration secretly weaponized the DOJ in 2018 to investigate some of the uh, sitting members of Congress. Well, these are the kind of things that we really need to make sure that we stay in 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 power. I mean, we stay not only in power, we stay engaged because this is not normal time. So thank God it's Friday because this Friday show is all about what the is going on, parties, politics, and post-primary breakdown. And we got a super lineup of guests to talk all about that. But before we get to that, I just want to remind everybody that we have the up and coming Summer of Summits brought to you by Network Nova, and we will be talking about that in the middle of the show today. So stay tuned to hear about how we're going to fire up Virginia for this upcoming election. So let's make sure that if you love the show, become a patron. Many of you in the room today for the cost of a cup of coffee can back our show. Good for us. How awesome. And then also um, make sure you like us on Facebook, you like us on Twitter. And if my team could put all that great stuff in the chat, um, that would be super. And the rules of the road. Remember, behave in the chat. We don't need to be negative here, but we love your opinion. So, so just please feel free to give the opinion, but keep it civil. And our favorite part, stick around for the after chat. That's where it, it really <laughs> happens. So let's bring on our great guest today. Uh, I would love to welcome Julie Jacksopic for a quick hello from Chair of Virginia's List. How you doing, Julie? Hello, great. Glad to be with you. Thanks. Well, your hair is fired up. Well, it's been fired up for you know a long time, but yeah, we'll keep firing up. I love it. You're bringing it always. We, we love the work you do for women in Virginia, so we can't wait to hear your your as we say her story, what happened in these uh, primaries, and what your vision is moving forward for 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 Virginia's list. So thanks, Julie, for being here. My right. pleasure, thanks. We think David Poole's in the room. David, are you here? I'm right here, yeah. So David, you made it, but you were in a pool of water. Right, we had a pipe bust in the office above us yesterday and we're we're locked out of the office for a few days. So I'm well, at home. You're, you're I'm glad you, you're able to join us. You are executive uh, director of the Virginia Public As Access Project. So we cannot wait to hear about the numbers you know, with the primary election to unpack all that for us. So thanks for being here, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And our new friend, Denver Riggleman, former CD congressional uh, candidate for, well, actually your former congressperson um, in CD5 and also owner or part owner in Silverback, a distillery where Denver has already invited, invited us all out for a drink today. Is that right? That is correct. So yeah, we, we're not that far away. You know, we're only about two and a half hours from DC. So ab absolutely. And my wife makes great whiskey. So come get yeah. some. Well, get we some. had a great back chat about that. And I'm so glad that um, to hear about that. So we definitely will be joining you out there for a drink to just talk more about what is going on in the Republican Party, Denver. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, whiskey is the best lubricant for discussion. So let's I do. think for both parties. <laughs> For both parties, we can agree on that. So I, I'm right. glad. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. And I want to bring up Jamie Perapato. Hey, Jamie, Executive Director, Turn It Blue. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Man, I missed you. It's been a long year. Yeah. And, and so how have you been in Pennsylvania? Good. It's been crazy here. I mean, things did not slow down following um, the presidential election. You know, we went right into it. Right. Um, so yeah, it's still crazy here. Well, a lot of people in the room may not know who you are, so we're going to make sure they do because you're a, a badass in Pennsylvania that we were just so happy to meet, and uh, we, you know, definitely shared how we're going to do this flipping things blue. But there's more to you than just that, so we can't wait to talk about what the heck is going on in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, we definitely need whiskey for that. Yeah. Yeah, all around whiskey. Okay. <laughs> and then we have two super candidates that are going to make sure that we are getting excited and fired up. That's what's going to bring it for this election in November. Our candidates like Bridget, Craighead, HD9, cosmetologists and activists. How are you? 
I'm doing well. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, awesome. Well, great. We hope to also we'll talk to you and unpack what you're doing over there and your in your in your studio doing some hair. Yeah, so I have some hair to do probably in about an hour. So, you know, I can relax and be a part of this show today. Yeah. <laughs> this is my only time I get to relax. So I'm happy to be here and be able to sit down a little bit. Yeah, take what you can get. That's what I say. And, and also, you have another sister joining you, another candidate from HT78, Melanie Cornell. They made me say your name. Cornelis? Cornelis. Cornelis, I know. Yeah. Cornelis, Cornelis. Uh, gun safety and public health is one of your something you're really a champion of. So, so thank you for joining us today. Hi, everybody, and I want to say, uh, Bridget, I'm a I'm a bridal seamstress. So between the two of us, we could turn out some beautiful, beautiful brides. I wish you were hey. a little closer. Queen, hey. you know, we can do that. That can be something we can do in the future. Okay, we, we share a lot in common in terms of uh, our working world. I love well, that. You know, Okay. I just did a wedding last week, so we can definitely connect in the future, girlfriend. Okay, okay. Good. And I put myself through college as a makeup artist, so. Oh my, oh my God. A long time ago, but, <laughs> but I'm like, wow. Okay. We got the whole set here. Who needs politics? Let's go and make women beautiful. Well, I hey, look, like I said before, I'm a cosmetologist turned into a politician. So, yeah. hey, obviously good. hairstylists and makeup artists do it better. I love it. I think this is a winning ticket for us. And I do think all we need now is, is somebody in the audience getting married. So put that in the chat. If you're, <laughs> if you're going to get married, we, we are going to make sure this summer we have your wedding and we can bring the whiskey. Denver will bring that and we'll Ooh. have a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, let's my get this, this is going to be such a party. It's going to be a party. Well, we got to get Friday started, as we say. And I want to introduce my awesome team that's doing that really is the, the backbone of what's going on here. We have Stair Calhoun, Ambassador of Buzz and Shock. And she's Good running everyone headquarters. Hey, Stair. Hey there. Hey, girl. And then Robin Zeff Warner, Postcards for Virginia. Also, she is our show wizard. Hey, Robin. Hello. hello. Where's Phoebe? Oh, oh. Phoebe. Oh, she, she is sleeping on the job. OK, well, get, that, get that cat going. Get that cat going, as we say. And of course, new addition, Rosemary Savino. Rosemary, also bringing it. She is our show support. How you doing, friend? I am loving. The lineup for today can't wait to hear what's going on me neither it's like what's going on okay well great let's get team. this show started let's get this show started and louisa borowski will be joining us she's our news anchor but she won't be coming into the the anchor of the show as we said so let's kick it off with julie hey julie let's just get this show started what's going on julie with virginia's list it was a so Virginia's list is a pack to elect pro-choice Democratic women, if you don't know, to state office. Uh, and it's been an interesting week. Um, some surprises, some welcome changes, some um, lots of excitement. And, and yet I also, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we would have liked to see one of our women win the, Governor, governor's, yeah, the governor's nomination. But, um, you know, and I, and I know that, that there's... Um, I think come November, we're all going to be really excited about having a ticket that is more diverse than we have typically seen. Yeah. And yet, you know, at the end of the day, anytime you have lots of people running, um, sometimes you have a candidate who wins who doesn't have the, you know, more than 50% of the vote. And so I think there, you know, there's certainly some people who I think are getting used to the, to our, our Lieutenant Governor nominee, but I think we're really excited for the first time to have a woman of color on the ticket. Right. Um, and and uh, are excited to, to work on her behalf. And then quite honestly, you know, I think we were really excited in 2017 on the House side, having really pulled women into parity. And we've done well over the years, but as people have moved up, there's been some shifts. And so I think we're looking at the opportunity to really cross parity in, in the House this time. And um, uh, not only hold on to the house, but to grow our numbers there. And so it's yeah. a, it's a, an exciting look forward and frankly, a relief to get past what I think was one of the more contentious primaries I've lived through. Well, you know, I think it's part of growing pains, but wouldn't you say, I mean, you've been around a lot longer than, than 
some of us just got started in, with the election of Trump, right? So you've seen it all. And what's nice about working with you is you have the long view, you've had a lot of experience. So we do get, you know, we do want things to hurry up. And we know that sometimes in Virginia, things aren't that way, but we've done a lot of work these last five years. And we are seeing obviously some fruits of that labor, a lot of dedication. What are you most proud of from this primary? I know you supported a lot of women that were stepping up to run. So what would you say, for your own personal view of things, what are you most proud of? I'm proud of the courage people have shown. Mm -hmm. I think I'm proud that women running is getting normal. Like when I did it six years ago, it was not normal. There were a handful of us um, and a handful of us struggling. And, and you know, we know that when women run, women win. Um, but there weren't enough of us out there. Um, and I also am proud that we're sort of... A, getting to a place where women running is normal, giving to women candidates is becoming more normal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it is not, when I first started doing this, women didn't, it, raising money was really hard. People didn't invest in women. Um, right. When I was running and I called and asked people, they were like, well, what makes you think you can handle those men down there? <laughs> um, not really a problem, but like, should, like, who do you, what do you want said down there? Right. What do you, what do you, what, right. what, what values do you want brought? And we should invest in those values and not worry about, um, about yes. some of those things. And so I think we're seeing not, we're still getting, I still have, you know, women candidates. We had a city council race here where, you know, nobody was asking the men with small children how they were going to do it, but boy, did the woman with small children get that question. It's so, I mean, there's still right. some ways to go, but we're not, but, um, it is funny but how it is changing. a sticking point, like I, you know, that these questions, you would think we've moved past some of that. I mean, but with the pandemic, it revealed, I mean, even greater that how much women were affected in these roles. So what, what the world does know is that it does, all this, some of this stuff does lay on women's shoulders. So they're like, hey, we haven't fixed all, fixed all this policy for you. And we don't have really good childcare. So if you really want to do this stuff, it's all your problem. So well, I think we are learning that childcare is infrastructure. Yes. And family and medical leave are infrastructure. And, and yet. I like that. I like how you said that. They're right. I mean, I usually talk about early care and education. I've worked really hard yeah. to focus on the educational part of it, right. but without it, we can't go to work. If, you know, I keep hearing these strange rumblings about why we're having a hard time hiring people. Well, the people we lost from the workforce were overwhelmingly women. Yes. And excuse me, but our kids are still home. Okay, not mine. I don't, I, my kid is 27. Yes. But, and she's my niece, not my kid. But, but truthfully, people, like exactly how do we expect people to go back to work when their kids no. are still home? And, and how do we get child, you know, how do we provide care for them when those people's kids are still home yes. um, and, and we tend to pay wages that you can meet doing Instacart and, and Uber, right? Like, I think we've right. got to think about, about what that role is. Sorry. It's my other right. hat in life. I know. Is and we're passionate about it. And, and I'm going to say to you that I think that's why what your work has been doing, getting women at the table brings up this and normalizes it. Right. So so I, I, I'm so grateful you came today, you joined us, and I look forward to actually having you at the Women's Summit and us continue to work together to elect women to office. And actually, we spoke to Deborah Rodman, and she was saying that she really is helping women be able to make that ask for money. Yep. And that's, I mean, Virginia's List was founded by a group of women who had done training to run and realize right. that you know, if you, you know if you can't and if you can't get the women out of their primary they can't win the general there and it, is. it was really founded to to make sure that money was available to people because yeah, well, that's until we change the way we fund elections that's that's, that's going to be a problem we don't have as much um particularly yeah. when we talk about women of color which i think is an important piece too because i think that's yeah. that's the electorate that's that is changing things if we were to narrow it um right. and and no, the yeah, asset gap right. there is also important. And so we just uh, need to continue to help um, help women win and well, help raise the well, money to do you. so. Well, you, you nailed it on a couple. Those are just real big points, money and reforming that. And it really allows more people to be at the table and diversity. Yeah. So thanks, Julie. We'll see you at the summit. 
Absolutely. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Looking good. Okay, David, let's unpack this with some numbers, some sexy numbers, David. Um, and tell us, what did you see in that election map and the differences 2017 um, over these years until this election? What, what do you got for us? Of course, uh, thanks for having me. And I, I should say uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks. I just want to talk a little bit about what BPAP is. And we're a 501c3 a nonprofit charity. We're governed by a board that's half Republican, half Democrat. So um, uh, if the Virginia Tea Party Federation wanted to have me come give a presentation, I'll, I'm happy sure. to so I'm, um, just want to make that clear. We're a nonpartisan group. Um, and well, this show is very much, we have Denver on and he's a Republican. So today we're showing our, bio, we call it multi-partisan, you know, so thank you, David. We definitely respect that. And we do have a lot of people on from C4s and C3s. So I'm glad you made that statement. We love the work you do. It's so important. It's, we're always on the, the VPAP. At first, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was some, some new medical like test, the VPAP. Everyone's like, do you get the VPAP? I'm like, I don't know. I, maybe I need the VPAP. It sounds like something important. But your site is super important. So if you can put that link in there, people need to donate to your organization. Your work is really super important to our work. So thank you. So, so yeah, with that said, what do you see? Well, let's talk about turnout. I mean, we all know the results. And so, you know, before we have an in-house contest to, to guess, predict what the turnout would be in this primary. And as you know, the 2017 uh, was a record. 9.9% um, of registered voters turned out in the Democratic primary. And so, you know, I kind of made my own guess. It was kind of like maybe about the same. My thought was, you know, Trump is off the ballot. That's going to, that's, uh, uh, the motivating force is not there. And he's no longer on Twitter every day, getting people riled up. Right. Um, and then but the other, on the other side, I thought, well, heck, you've got all these candidates uh, spending millions of dollars running statewide. And you also have all these, uh, a record number, 14 House Democrat incumbents motivating and, and, and getting their networks going because they're facing a, a primary challenge. Right. I thought that those kind of might balance out. The answer was no, it didn't. Um, the turnout was uh, about 14.5% uh, lower. And that might go up a little bit. We're going to see today, as you know, there's some um, late absentee ballots come in so that the turnout will probably be closer, you know, will be not quite as far. But but that was, that was a surprise to us. And one thing we saw... Um, and I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Do I have that? Yes. Do I have that uh, well, as Robin is the master of the yes, sharing the screen. Have, so go yes. Ahead. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yes, All sir. Right. So I'm going to share um, with you um, a couple of visuals and then um, any questions you might have. So this was uh, this was the the demographic turnout. A look at the early voters in the Democratic primary, and we were stunned by this. Um, you know, I just turned 60 this year, so I'm not I'm 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 not offended, but People over 60 accounted for you know, almost two thirds of the vote. People over 70 were um, a third of the vote. So it was just really interesting to see, you know, those of us who mm -hmm. kind of spend some time on Twitter, um, you know, you hear Twitter's not real life. I mean, that's, that's a, we thought it was a pretty amazing uh, statistic. And I, I think that, you know, obviously if you're, if you're the McCall or Herring campaign, that was a, a real comfort to you. Um, you know, but, right. but that, that, that's, um, so that's one of the first things we noticed kind of right out of the gate was, um, you know, hold on a second, I've lost my. No, I see that. Um, and I think it sort of speaks to who really, who does vote, right? Especially pays right. it is older, uh, older folks, like, you know, over 40, but really over 50 to that, old, that generation are really usually the most consistent voters. Is that, that, and then right? Correct. And um, you, so let you me know, try to yeah. get back up here for a second. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, and you, you see the young voters, which is interesting with all this really um, enthusiasm to vote. I mean, I don't think I voted in a primary, I'll be honest, until Barack Obama was on the ticket. So it doesn't surprise me. Um, your most diehard Democrats vote in the primary, right? Your Democratic committee type people. Older older folks pay attention, but this this general will I think we'll see a turnout. Um, hopefully, I don't know if we'll match 2017. Though, what's your thoughts? 
Well, that's the, in the general. Yes. I mean, and that's that's the real question for um, the Democratic Party is, you know, in the, since Trump's election in 2016, and Denver can tell us all about this from his perspective, you know, the, the wind has been at the at the back of, of, of Democrats for four cycles, um, or really the th last three cycles. The question is, you know, which way is the wind, how strongly will the wind be blowing, how, what mm -hmm. direction in this election and you can see in this uh, on this the screen here this was the change in turnout from 2017 purple being turnout fell and green being it went up and it's largely kind of went down across the board probably the strongest was in uh denver's neck of the woods um that was because tom you remember in 2017 tom Piriello was on the campaign right. that was a footprint of his congressional district and the darkest right here. Um, well, David, uh, I, I'm seeing the early frequency beating. Are we seeing the right map that you're talking about? Because I don't think you have the right one. Put the pri click on the primary turnout tab, and then I know maybe you you're blinded by it. Try it again. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm it's sorry. All good. Yeah. Look, we're we're all friends here. Every not yeah. everything go. You know, just how it is. Zoom. Okay. I'm. Um, Show us that numbers because I know where you're. Yes, there is we this, go. Perfect, okay. perfect. So here we go. This this shows. I'm sorry. The map of Virginia, purple again is it fell um, from 2017 relative, and green it went up. Hmm. The ground central was Nelson County. If you remember in 2017, not only was Tom Periello who ha that was you know um, yeah district, Denver's district, but the pipeline. Um, uh, debate was in full force at that point. Um, so the turnout, uh, the people there were less motivated. We did a visual today um, that looked at uh, turnout kind of a different way, um, looked at by urban, a uh, rural, suburban, urban. And you can see, um, again, this is kind of what the Democrats more, uh, more cowbell, right? More urban um, and less uh, 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 rural in the turnout. Um, mm -hmm. In the region, you can see basically um, the urban crescent uh, did not fall as much, um, and the rest of the state fell more than the state average. Mm -hmm. so again, it's this this um, the Democrats' stronghold, um, you know. It, but outside of that, um, it, right, it's it's not as strong. Of course, the votes are all you know. You take the capital region, Hampton Roads, and Northern Virginia, and you've got you know at least two thirds, probably more of the vote. But anyway, that's that's the profile of the turnout uh, that we've been able to visualize on mapped.org. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. And I, especially while you had Andrew McCullen on, so, so I would assume you have maybe some more Hampton Roads turnout. I mean, you can see there's some excitement there a little bit, but still down, it feels like, right? And I do think that we'll know later um, when we unpack all this even more, when you talk to voters more, if this is really pandemic, also people coming out. And I think there's just a general mood of people trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> and, and there's so much going on every day that I don't think a lot of people are super focused right now on this. And well, so, I mean, that's kind of my feeling when I talk to people, um, there's more priorities coming on people, job, job loss, uh, just, just kids in school. There's just priorities of every day that primary just doesn't speak to. Yeah, that's uh, what you just said. Is, uh, BPAP has, I don't know if I'm getting kidding. BPAP yeah, has okay. a problem just getting people interested in politics because like you said, people are busy um, putting food on the table, keeping their marriage together and figuring out yeah. what the hell the teenagers are doing. <laughs> I know what some of them did all summer, so <laughs> hopefully we'll get them back on track. Well, David, thank you for being here. I am excited to have you back because um, I think these numbers as we move into the general and we could, I did see one thing and I wanted to ask you, there was a few counties in the rural areas that did have bigger turnout. Is that right? And I just don't have the map in front of me where there was a little bit of a change that and I don't know if it was because Sam was still was on the ticket that there was some interest in voting in some areas. You had Andrew McCullen on the ticket in some areas, and there seemed to be enthusiasm, maybe, but in small pieces of the map rather than overall. One thing to look at was there a, a Democratic primary going on, a local race, something that. Oh, okay, like Alexandria's race. Right. 
Exactly. And I, yeah, Alexandria, where, where Julie is, that was, everybody was voting there. You had a lot of people. And I think that's why today when we're going to really have two delegates on that are running, in general, from Republican, Democratic side, what's, what gets people excited is their local politicians. That really affects their life. So, David, stay out of that pool of water. We're glad you're doing the work you're doing, and um, we're glad that VPAP exists because you do great work. Everybody throws David five bucks for that organization for all that good work. So we hope to have you on again. Great. Appreciate it. Thank right. you. You're looking good. See ya. All right. The man of the hour, Denver Riggleman. We've been waiting for a long, for weeks now to get you on the show. I know you've been busy. I've seen you on MSNBC. How does it feel now to be a pundit? <laughs> well, I hope I tell you, I had one day where I was on uh, Fox, BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Bloomberg, and I can't some other off network, I think, from maybe Japan yeah. or something in a day. And, wow. you know, and it's just amazing. You know, I was on the, uh, the tab for videos for CNN, front page of Fox for the cyber attack. And, uh, you know, everybody's like, who are you? You know, what, <laughs> what, what's going on? What's going on, right? And. <laughs> And I hate, I don't even know, you know, because people keep saying, well, Denver, you know, you're pissing a lot of people off. They must be paying you a lot of money. I'm like, well, I'm just mm -hmm. sort of pissing them off for free. I, I, I won't take money for any of these gigs uh, for any speaking. I'm not, uh, I'm not a contributor for any network. And that's allowed right. me to talk to anybody. And I will talk to anybody. I'm not afraid to go on anything, um, whether it's, uh, I'm just not afraid. And it's well, been interesting. I love that voice, and I'm sure that whiskey gives you all the courage. And you sound like when we were talking in the pre-chat that you married the, you married up, as we say, you married the right woman who is partnering with you in that distillery, Silver Silverback. And I'm just giving you those kudos because um, we do need, need need people from all walks of life, but but somebody from your stature of being a former congressperson, also living and working out in Virginia to have a voice in what's going on in our democracy. I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person, I identify with de democratic politics, dem the democratic side, but truthfully, I also mostly run with a lot of Republican friends as well. And I feel like our country is strong when we have two parties and we have opposing maybe differences on policy, but this is not normal. So I want, I really just hope you can tell us, first of all, in your perspective, when do you feel like this really started? And when did you see something very strange happening? Like when you saw this change, I'm just really interested from your point of view. Sure. For me personally, it was, uh, and you guys might remember this, it was August of 2019. Uh, and I want to get you guys some background. You know, I got in trouble pretty early because, you know, my background, I know we mm -hmm. talk whiskey distilling and laugh about it, but you know, my background for 20 years has been kinetic and non-kinetic targeting, not only with bombs and munitions, but also in cyber mm. infrastructure attack, data analytics and algorithmic warfare, right? So when I was elected in 2018, I was a senior consultant at the Office of Secretary of Defense for Electronic Warfare and Countermeasures. So I'm, I, I have a background that's a little unique, I think, yes. to anybody who's been in Congress before. And it was about August of 2019, something happened when I officiated the same-sex wedding, if, if anybody remembers yes. that. Um, it was about a week later that I found out that some of the churches... They had hired people to go to the churches and say that I was trying to change the sexual orientation of children. Um, and I also, you know, that was when I started to see that maybe, you know, the, the anger, I knew there'd be some pushback, right? But I didn't really give a rats at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I figured there were would be, but like, you know, I'll just message the Republican Party is a party, party of freedom. This should be something where we don't care about. Why, why do we care what people do anyway? Because I don't, right? I just don't. Right. Um, but what I found is that, you know, I might shock some people on here. I'm pretty blunt about some things. So I apologize beforehand, but I'm not overtly religious, right? I mean, there, you know, I, I've had some crazy things happen in the military and things like that, but I'm not, you know, an evangelical or anything like that. And I think that really got people sideways. And when they combine mm -hmm. that with, with the wedding and things like that, I think it almost became almost, um, almost a good versus evil type of thing. But I wondered why it was, it was that way. Why was it apocalyptic? Why was it messianic? So I'm like, where is this coming from? And that's when, you know, I started doing my research. And since I had a little bit of chops and disinformation and ISIS and right. counterterrorism, I'm like, holy crap, what is this QAnon stuff? Um, 
And oh, and, and once, and I knew that there was a baseline of anti-Semitism because immediately it came out that I was being funded by George Soros and the Rothschilds, right? Um, I was a secret agent of right. the Democrats, right? I must be part of the cabal. I must have something to hide, right? I must be right. also drawing down the blood of children in secret temples. Um, so it, it got really crazy. Um, but I still thought I was naive, uh, Kathy. Right. I thought that facts would win, just blunt force facts. And what I find out is that, you know, you, it's, it's really humbling. And I've been more humbled, I think, in the last two or three years and any time of my life is that I, I found out how naive I was mm -hmm. and uh, that some of these facts-based arguments, as far as they were concerned, uh, weren't facts-based at all. They were simply good against evil. And I was on the bad side. No, I mean, that that is crazy. It's almost like you could write a novel, right? Like uh, Cabal, Eating Children, uh, all this stuff. And I, I agree with this, this, this QAnon. Um, it's really a a poisoning and and with your intelligence background you is this so, this sounds so and i don't want to like the russian based stuff but if you study this history of what how russian uses this disinformation i think there's even a word for it how they kind of turn your you know how they're able to turn the population this way and they've done it in russia and you can see it and i am interested what your opinion of when you see the tactics being used here i mean you could see these tactics you can see what's going on with with how it's being used and right. who was be in your mind like who was behind this is it is it our own inside people in the I, I just can't figure out like what is the ultimate goal is it just freaking raw power just fucking who cares like let's just kill let's just <laughs> like what is it like because i'm like thinking it used to be okay. I don't know. Is it just really pure power of a certain class of people, and we're all naive down here, um, trying to fight each other and hate each other? And truthfully, it's just pure power. Well, when you have coordinated inauthentic activity, right, or behavior, what happens is you can have foreign assets, right? You can have foreign influence. If you look at, say, what happened lately with COVID nineteen forty eight and all Hitler and Jew, all Jews are Hitler, right? That was actually multiple accounts created by Iranians in May of 2020. Um, when you look at coordinated and authentic activity for QAnon or conspiracy theories like New World Order or 1984, which is different from 1948, this gets crazy, guys. Right. Um, I, I have a lot of this in my head, so I'm going to try to simplify this because I want to get nuts. Here. No, this is, I want to know it. Come yeah. on. Um, well, what happens that you have is that you have troll-based um, policymaking. So, you know, I'm also the chief strategist for the Network Contagion Research Institute, um, which so we have every tweet going back to 2006. Uh, we also track all the Reddit and subreddit right. threads, and we also look at Telegram. But I guess what I'm telling everybody here is that we put out a report, and I think this is going to shock people, and I'm not really trying to. But if you guys, do you guys remember Obamagate or subpoena Obama when that's oh, yeah. right? Obamagate was actually started by an online troll in the Reddit threads, and it actually... Um, matriculated up uh, from the bottom of the internet, which we first saw it on some of the subreddits, but my guess is it started in the right. chain, right? Well, it, then it hit Twitter and it hit a guy called E, just E dot, right? His handle was, here you go, guys, at follow the 17. Oh. The 17th letter is Q, right? So what happened was he said, let's see if we can get the president um, to subpoena Obama or Obamagate right, for the illegal activities that he did. And right. I go, that is a very long conversation, by the way. So anyhow, 44 hours after that, President Trump tweeted to Lindsey Graham to subpoena Obama or for Obamagate. This is how it works. You have, and you can call them trolls, you can call them influence, right. but you have you sort of these um, purveyors of, um, of crap, um, that of digital crap, right, right, that they push up, and that digital crap became White House policy. Now, as a Republican, you're you should be appalled if you're a conservative, right? It it should right. be saying, wait a second, that is absolutely shite, right? You can't, we can't actually do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and point that out, right? Holy crap. Holy, I mean, it is it's almost like crazy that I'm like you. I'm thinking we'll get through this because we it's facts or just normal. And even my I call them normal friends, Republicans, and we'll have a conversation. And then I'm like, you know what? This isn't good. And I saw you on the show the other day when you said people coming into to your business and people that you know and you love and they're really stuck in this uh, not 
I guess, like Tim yeah, Ryan said, incoherent and not living in reality. Well, we have David on here. If you look at what happened in the elections in the past few days, a lot of individuals that won the Republican primaries were heavily steeped into the election integrity sort of stop the steal yeah. methodologies, right? You know, and, and I remember a few years ago, you guys, I hope everybody knows I've been in politics maybe three and a half, four years. Right. right? And my first real taste of disinformation was Bigfoot erotica. If you guys ever want to talk about that fun time that I had. <laughs> but, um, and I did write a book on it, right? Bigfoot, it's complicated, which is out there and doing pretty well. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, about disinformation and how that actually how it starts. And, you know, you, you haven't lived until they write a pic, uh, draw a picture of you as a troll, you know, crossed with Bigfoot with me love Trump, you know, down on the corner in Charlottesville. It's great stuff. But I laughed, you know, and I think people never real, thought they would get to me. It just doesn't. I just don't care. But right. I think um, when you're looking at this, when you're looking at individuals coming in, election integrity in a couple of those districts were polling at 30 points above the next topic, guys. Mm -hmm. 30 points 30 points when you look at enthusiasm across the board i have never seen republicans this excited this they're in the swim lane and you know so and and and, and i'll tell you it is odd because you know i'm sort of a conservative guy right um but mm -hmm. i don't really fit anywhere right i'm right socially libertarian but i'm fiscally conservative i i want as many people to vote as possible but i'm not a big fan of hr1 which the aclu isn't either but i I have constitutional issues with it, but I understand, you know, so I'm always trying right. to policy that doesn't really work in this tribe anymore. These tri tribal right. politics, what happens is that you have <clears throat> honestly an emotive hyperbolic thing that started with conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. and now it's baked in. And I guess what I'm telling everybody is that we can have these discussions. We can talk about facts. But if it's an apocalyptic or messianic conspiracy theory of good against evil, uh, you're sort of you're sort of spitting in the wind here. Yeah, so, I mean, what? So what? Yeah. So you know, to get kind of get to the. Sorry if that was too. I'm sorry. No, if I no, but I no. This is like right up my alley. I can't wait to go out to Sil to Silverback and spend more time on, sure. at the bar learning more because it's it's really it's not it. Like I am, we are thinking, like you said, this is so crazy, it can't be real, but it is. The insurrection oh, yeah. on January 6th, so we get to there. So what we're saying is that this danger is growing, actually. I We all thought it would maybe abate, but now that the Republicans, unfortunately, I thought more of my Republican friends than they must have thought of themselves, because a lot of them up there were just like, okay, we're all going to sign this paper, say election, you know, the... Biden didn't win the election, and then they just really even went deeper, and now the insurrection was a tour. I guess it was it's a new tour of that I'm, you know, that you can buy a ticket to now, I guess. But it is super dangerous, and I'm super, I, I feel like I am, don't know where my country is going. And with that, last thoughts on that, and um, one thing I, I love that you also said is that, and I hope more people rally to that, um, that we do have to work together on this. People, common sense people like you, it's about our country because I don't know where it's going if this continues. Uh, I don't know how we'll operate. I, I really don't, don't. You know, guys, you, so I have a, I don't know if it's exactly comparable, but you know, I remember 9-11, right? I, I was with something called the Air Expeditionary Wing. Right. Um, so I was one of the first to deploy after 9-11. Um, so I, I mission planned the first bombing runs in Afghanistan. I have a, I've had a hell of a life. January 6th gave me that feeling, but in a way that's hard to describe. It was almost because I was getting text messages from my Republican and Democratic colleagues simultaneously. Think about that, right? I had just left three days before. I had so much anger and uh, I'm like, well, how is this? We knew about this, right? I, I had looked at open source. We had put out some of those warnings. I'm like, what happened to the coordination here? And I want to tell you guys this. The, the reason we need a 1-6 commission is not because of the specific um, criminal case we're looking at right now when we're looking at how the networks work and things like that. The reason we need a commission is because we need to see why it happened, not the specific individuals involved. There's an analytical component to this commission. We need to do a hot wash. We need to do a debrief. We need to look at who was who in the zoo. We need to look at maybe other comms methods that we haven't looked at before. We need to look at other social networks. We need to see how wasn't the police involved? Why weren't they involved? What happened with Intel communications and coordination? It's both sides. How are these people radicalized from soup to nuts? 
And also, how would the communications and logistics breakdowns happen to soup to nuts? We put those together, and I think there's some people that fear what could come out of a, an exhaustive, you know, sort of hot wash or debrief into this. I'm muted. You hit it on the head. I think there's a lot of fear of why they don't want this commission, because I think there's so many people that are kind of, in a way, obviously involved. And, you know, and my fear when I look at this radicalization, it reminds me when I see some countries that, you know, and I see how the Taliban built themselves up with this re religious kind of osity. And this, just like you said, this, um, when you mix those two and it's not good and you just see that <laughs> oh. it's not good at all. Right. I'm like no. you. Um, so I so appreciate you coming on and, uh, Last, just one takeaway for us Democrats in this election about when you say they're swimming up lane, what, what would you think, what little nugget can you tell us about your view that would help us, not help us, but um, make sure that, that this election just sends a great signal to Republicans. I don't think people deserve to, to govern people. They can't deliver good things for the people, but there shouldn't just be this wash away, everybody gets to forget and you get to like run a country or run a governorship list. But what's your point of view of a, a major, like a little takeaway that will help us understand what's going on? There's no way that you're gonna be able to quell the enthusiasm for the 2022 midterms for the Republicans, not gonna happen. Um, right. Screaming and yelling isn't gonna work, it's there. Yeah, and it's baked in, as I said before, the issue that you have is how do you present, you know, a cogent message that we are here actually not only for democracy, but as Americans. Yeah. Um, you know, I had this ABC I talked to today, National ABC, and he had the same question. He's like, oh my God, Ben, like you, you, we, we see that you have a conservative voting record. How, but why, why are you like this very small minority of individuals speaking out? So here's, here's the ticket, guys. All you have to do is follow the fundraising and the polling. It's a baked in belief system that fundraising works with hyperbole and the polling is along with election integrity and Trump support going in. Somebody said the other day, and I'll end with this, 35 to 36% of people support Trump. You're like, yeah, right. So, right? That's BS. That's not correct because what you have to look further down the polling, if it's 75 to 80% of Republicans, every Republican has to run in that lane if they're serious about winning a large election. They have to fundraise off that language and they have to follow the polling based on the messaging that's coming from their internal polling. It's that politically simple. So if you want to scream, talk about taking back America, they already believe that America is under attack. Right. You know? They're fighting this. So I guess what I'm saying is that you just have to be strong in your messaging, you have to make sure you get out votes for Americans. Listen, yes. there's some Republicans I love. There's some great ones out there. But those that are messaging on specific conspiracy theories is going to take a massive effort on the parts of Democrats to get the enthusiasm and fundraising up to where they can fight them in some of these districts. All right. Well, thank you, Denver. We'll be back in touch and I will definitely be out to visit and and we'll get you and Cameron Webb on. Um, thank you for your service in general. Thank um, you super intelligent. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to speak with you and good luck. And we'll see you for a shot soon at the bar, I hope. I so. hope so. And I would stay longer, but I actually have a business meeting that I have to get it's okay. to. But I, but I appreciate all of you and thanks for taking the time and being so kind. I appreciate yeah, thanks. Well, uh, Jamie Perifato, come on up on the screen. And uh, what are your thoughts as a activist, organizer, and NPA, you are personally dealing with um, what the Republicans are doing now in your state. So with listening to Denver and if, who Denver Riggleman is, he was a congressman. He was, as he said, lost his seat to a really this Bob Good who's in our state, super, super just, I don't know, radical. I don't know what you even call him, but just um, unbelievable uh, right wingish and whatever. Um, Here's an intelligent guy coming on the show, fighting with Democrats, basically. What are you seeing in Pennsylvania? First, tell us about what you experienced during the 2020 election with the voting in Pennsylvania. All eyes were on you, Jamie. Um, and then what, you're, what are you thinking about with what's happening now in your state? So thanks for having me here. Listening to this, especially when you're talking about Virginia, where you guys actually talk about policy. I'm like texting people. I'm like, they actually legislate there. You know, Pennsylvania is a tough place. I mean, Trump won it by, you know, point, what was it, point seven, and then Biden won it by one point. It was tight. It's always tight here. It's going to keep being tight here. Um, right. 
because there's massive turnout. But the issue with these like fringy people with the QAnon people, like they're not fringe here in Pennsylvania. We have eight, our congressional delegations, 18 members from Pennsylvania split down the middle, except for of the Republicans, nine, I would say seven, eight of them are extremists. They are stop the steal. They support the insurrection. They are constantly trying to undermine um, President Biden, the constitution. Uh, you know, as we, I was sitting here, I was getting a text because our Republican controlled legislature is just as bad. And then, you know, they're coming after voting rights. So, um, mm. yeah, we're that's a warning for us, that. right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's have, terrible here. Yeah. And, and what we have is one, it took us a while to, and we've only had really power here for two years with the complete trifecta, as we said, and that's what we have to get at to the regular voter is what's at stake. And you are living it. We are living it here. Um, you know, 22 is a big year for us. We have um, the probably the top Senate race in the country to, uh, to uh, replace Pat Toomey. Um, right. I'm sure you've heard of Pat Toomey. You did not yes. hear from Pat Toomey because he did not show up for the vote about the commission. He decided not to attend. He, ha he had prior... Uh, yeah. family engagement oh he did so okay. he was busy so he did not vote um to the surprise of no one like here's my surprise face you know, but um <laughs> well what are you guys doing now as, as activists i mean you went through this this count we were watching your state how it won for biden but it really i mean um just the crazy stories that were coming out and then recently I heard that right now they want to do a recount in Pennsylvania. Is that true or what, is it just noise? No, it's, I mean, it's very polarized here. You know, we also, in addition to having the um, Senate, the Senate race coming up, we mm -hmm. also have a new governor's race. So Governor Wolf, who's wow. a Democrat and has been very supportive. Um, you know, the man's veto pen must be out of ink by now because that's what he does. He defends. <laughs> right. He plays defense, you know, he, that's why I say like, oh my God, they legislate like, you know, our people are great and they never get to do that. They just play defense. So the Republicans are, um, you know, they're very right wing here. And Trump has handpicked the fool that he wants to run for governor here, who was actually on the Capitol steps during the election. Oh, you're kidding. Oh my Doug God. Mastriano, who's a state senator now, nuts as the day is long. He is, um, and Trump is already tr trying to get himself in this election. So um, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really strange. It, I mean, I don't, sometimes I just don't, um, it, it's just like I said to Denver, I, I'm just trying to figure out what is the overall picture? Is the overall picture just to turn America into this minority ruled authoritarian state? And I, uh, you know, that seems like, it's not crazy talk, but it seems like, you know, I mean, it's power. It's, it's power. all power. It's power. That's it. You know, right? like basically, you know, the more of a voice that people of color have, that women have, the less that these, you know, these people have. It's all, you know, it's all, yes. you know, extreme capitalism. It's all greed. That's it's all money. That's what it's, it's all about. money. So let's talk about us, as we say, organizers, activists. What are what are you saying um, right now? I know we are feeling here. We're trying to get ramped up because. Your frustration, when we had the governor that just had the pen veto, we didn't have the legislature. Now we flipped it all. Now we have both, which is awesome. Now we have to hold the line. It just feels like, my God, it never stops. Um, how are your people feeling? Um, are you gonna be working at all in Virginia to help us in 2021? Or are you just, are you doing, um, how can we work together, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, we, I mean, we're fighting battles every day here now. Um, for this, we have judicial races coming up. And the oh. courts are kind of what saves us. Um, we just lost a brutal um, ballot question that uh, allowed the Republicans to limit the governor's emergency powers. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, right. So they open. You're, you're busy. So yeah, we've got a lot going on. They just the <laughs> state legislature. Uh, you know, we're all going to have new lines, and the state legislature is trying to pound through as much horrible stuff as possible, knowing the governor is going to veto it. Last week, we had another heartbeat bill or the Down syndrome bill. It's a war yes. on women lately. It's and a war yeah, on women. the fetal remains bill, it passed again, which is requires any woman who has a miscarriage or a, a, an abortion or any sort of terminated pregnancy yeah. to get a death certificate under civil fine or penalty if, if you right. don't. Well, you know, I think that it's, it was 
one, great to connect with you. And I think by us organizers always staying in touch or activists, we just learn from each other what you're doing that's working, you know, how we can make sure we keep people engaged, all that good stuff. But more importantly, hearing this from you just gets me more fired up because I know we have to hold this line. I know not everybody, even our primary outcome with some, with some, it's not even about winning. It's, it's just trying to figure out like how your own state party works and their values opposed to your values. I mean, you know how you go through a primary and you're like, but we have so much at stake here. We got, you know, it's like putting your family bad problems in the back seat and just keep driving the car because yeah. this is crazy. Uh, these bills and how our life will change in Virginia if we do, if we just get involved in these, you know, you know, get we lost. Get new lines because of the census. Yeah, we have new gonna... district lines across the country because of the census. Right. So if we get fair lines, I mean, that does not bode well for Republicans. So this is kind of, I feel like, you know, they got the Supreme Court, they got their judges in, they're right. trying to jam in everything they possibly can before we start to have free and fair elections. Yeah, and we're trying to act like Joe Manchin's like, well, when things were this way and we're all normal, well, you know what, there is no normal. And to save our democracy, I think we're going to have to look at, you know, that the, this it's no more we can't it's it, you can't play this kind of sport when the everything has changed about it and he's still trying to be this i get it but at the same time i'm like things are a little different we, it's kind of crazies in the room and we need to stop this you know so jamie thank you so much for being thank here you. yeah i hope we get to, again i'll come up to pennsylvania have a beer have a glass of wine or two um okay so let's do a little bit of shopping and talk about the women's summit Absolutely. Are you going, Robin? I'm going. Go Here we go. Up. So the Women's Summit, we are so excited. This is going to be a, like a summit like no other. It's going to happen not just online. We're going to have all sorts of training on the number one topic that we've been talking about today on messaging. We're also going to have live events in three different locations, three different months, and all of it for the low price of $40. And if that's too much for you, we've got a give me a break from COVID $20 price. So we have all sorts of online trainings that you can um, be a part of. As I said, it's all on messaging. And these are gonna be trainings. This is not a quick one hour show and go you're gonna actually be learning about how to talk to your crew, how to talk to strangers, how to talk um, about any subject. And we're also gonna be talking about how to talk about uncomfortable topics, how to raise the comfort level. Now, the piece de resistance is going to be our in-person events because we get to meet in person and we're kicking off our Summer of Summits rally in Northern Virginia. On June 25th, we're gonna have a grassroots mix and mingle at Rowan Tree. And then, and then on Saturday, starting in the early evening afternoon, we were going to we'll meet at uh, the Turning Point Suffragettes Memorial, which is an Aquaquan Regional Park, learn about the memorial, and then we'll march across the street to the beautiful Riverview and have one of our incredible rallies. You won't wanna miss it, it will be a picnic um, event to be there right along the, um, the um, Aquaquan River. Then, but Ooh. it would never be a women's summit without swag. And I'm gonna turn it over to our swag queen. Stare, tell us about some of our swag because we are lighting it on fire. We need to be on fire this election and the women's summit is on fire. Thank you, Robin. I first want to say a big shout out to Dennis. Without Dennis, this never would have happened. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, we've got a beach towel this year. We've got t-shirts. We have a cap. Okay. And of course, we'll have postcards. So watch for all of this. We'll have everything available at our kickoff rally. And I also want to say how honored we are and delighted to kick off at the National uh, Turning Point Suffragist Memorial, so timely. We want to be a sponsor. We want to thank our sponsors. Still time to be a sponsor. And um, an all things summit you can find out on our website, networknova.org. 
I think I did that in record time. So <laughs> we can now, Catherine, I'm going to give it back to you so you can talk to our amazing candidates. I know, I'm so we excited. Have. Okay, like I am so excited. I just want to tell everybody why there's a beach towel because um, we just thought we know we're going to Virginia Beach where it's hot and our candidates, we need to win that tidewater. That's where we think a lot of activity is going to happen where Republicans will try to take that power away from us. So our beach towels are going to be on the beach, on everywhere. When you lay that beach towel out, everybody will see when we vote, we win and we'll have them at the picnic. So th this year we like to have fun. So who doesn't like to have fun, right, Bridget? Um, Let's talk about what you're doing over there in the shop, Bridget Craighead, Craighead cosmetologist yes, activist. Give us a little background. We know a little bit about you and your stardom, but you just were telling us something that you just also won recently. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Oh, well, um, so last year when we were protesting for the uh, George Floyd murder um we did a documentary with a group um called uh, aj plus they are on youtube and that documentary has been seen by 1.1 million people and it is now up for an uh, emmy uh, i think it's like wow. a regional emmy so i think that's pretty awesome that's what's going on I love that's what's it. going on girl. that's what's going on yeah and last time you were here too um you, uh you were saying you needed signs. And so tell us about, about your candidacy and what you do and what you need. And um, and you, you just look great, by the way. I think- Thank you, Queen. Yeah. All of y'all look good. All 110 that's in this chat right now, we look good, okay? We got a team. <laughs> well, well, um, to talk about what we talked about last time, um, we're still, I think we supposed to get signs this week, finally you know the money has been kind of you know it's coming and you know I'm trying to get my name out there and you know getting people fired up for what I have going on so the money has been coming and um hopefully by this weekend we will have it for our future well, well excuse me we have an event tomorrow on BLM yeah. we have a Father's Day program where we're uplifting the fathers in the community um nice. so hopefully we will have them today sometime so I can put my signs up um, because now I know who my opponent is, Rain Williams. I don't know if you all have been watching. Right. Um, yeah, so he just uh, outseated our 14-year incumbent, Charles Poindexter. So now this young Trumpian, that's what I'm going to call him. Okay. Yes, he is coming for me, y'all. But it's all good because I'm fired up. I'm ready to work. Well, you're. yeah, we're going to get a <laughs> towel. We're going to get a towel for you. There's no I want it all. I want a towel. I want, I want a hat. A towel. Yeah, we want a hat, a towel, and a tote bag, as we say. Well, yes, ma'am. You know, um, it's so important the values you're fighting over there, and uh, and how you got into this. I mean, as an activist and the protest, and then really, yeah, this has changed your life. Here you are. I'm thinking you have children. You're working. You're doing it all, and then you're trying to save your. It really work for the people in your district and what do they need the most in your in your mind well um it's it's jobs it's um it, it's health care it, it's having those services like patrick county um like i said brain williams he's from patrick county his his argument is you know gun and voter integrity but they actually need a hospital they need some type of medical assistant there. I have not heard them say anything about, you know, the, the needs of what people, you know, right. need there. Um, so definitely, yeah. you know, um, creating. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I just, sorry. I just love what you said. I mean, people need these things and they're trying to still sell voter integrity or, you know, their cultural kind of things about Dr. Seuss, they think this is enough. And I think that what our job is to do is definitely deliver this. Stay right here with us, cause I don't, we're getting on one o'clock and I wanna bring Melanie on. Um, right. so, yeah, so let's we'll all have a conversation. Melanie, we're so grateful you're stepping up to run. Tell us about your race, your district, your opponent and how we can help you. Sure, thank you. Um, very nice to be with you today. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I, um, yes, it's, it's all a bit of a whirlwind because I made the decision very quickly when our Democratic candidate uh, sort of fell out fairly last minute, decided not to turn in his paperwork. Uh -oh. um, and that left um, our district 78 um, unopposed by the Republican here, whose name is Jay Leftwich. Jay Leftwich has run unopposed uh, in Chesapeake since um, 2013, so for mm -hmm. eight years. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm very familiar with Delegate Leftwich because um, when, when uh, we moved out here five years ago, I um, decided that I wanted to get involved in advocacy and found Moms Demand Action for Gun right. Sense, which um, most of you probably know, but is, a, is an organization where um, we work, it's a, um, it's a nonpartisan grassroots organization mm -hmm. started by a mom. Yep. And we work very hard to end gun violence. And we, we do that through legislation and we do it through education. Um, and so I have been the lead here in Chesapeake for uh, about three years. I have to step down, unfortunately, if I'm gonna mm -hmm. run as a candidate, but I'm leaving it in the very, very capable hands of some other people in our group. But um, through this organization, I have learned how, a, a lot about uh, the General Assembly, a lot about how laws right. get made, a lot about how, uh, the appropriate way to talk to legislators if you'd like to get them on board with what you're saying. Um, I have two, two boys. I've got a four-year-old and a 14-year-old and, um, and a job, which to be perfectly honest, I, uh, I basically lost all of my business because of COVID. <laughs> Oh, you know, really? people aren't having people weren't having weddings for like a year. I, it's starting to kind of slowly come back, but um, like like many many people in Virginia, um, right. my you know my livelihood was completely interrupted. Um, and and, and you were frankly, were you an event planner for weddings? Is that what you were? No, I'm a bridal seamstress. So once oh, you're people, the seamstress, right? Yeah, well, the I'm the seam, I'm the one with the quilt in the background. Right? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that's that. Uh, so in a sense of right now, you're just stepping up. And I know what, I hope that you stay with the Power Lunch and stay with um, this group, because one thing that's been happening, Bridget's been coming here. A lot of the candidates have been um, finding it useful to check in with other candidates also and find the support. Yeah. So we'd like to connect you with resources, whatever you, you know, what you need. So if you can stay for the after chat, we can dig a little deeper and see what we, how we can help you in the room. Um, so please stay around because we're on what we're getting a little over time, but I want to make sure that we we really work with you. So thank you for being here and for stepping up. And we will definitely make sure you have support um, because we have to make sure that if you're going to step up, we can't we have to support people. Right. That's just the way it is. So if we can bring Louisa Borowski up to do the grassroots coalition report and how Melanie, if you've been to a coalition meeting yet. <coughs> Unfortunately, Louisa had to go. So okay, so, uh, okay. so we, well, we, we did a good report in general. So good. So we're at the top of the hour, right, Robin? Yes, we are. Yeah, well, then let's stay around for the after chat. Let's um, let's just say in this room what's going on. We learned a lot. We went a little. What, what we do know is that when we have something to talk about, we will keep talking. And with Denver today and Jamie, and Bridget and Melanie and Julie and David. I mean, we just had ourselves a great conversation. So we hope you join us next week. And next week, remind me, Robin, I always want to ask you, what are we doing next week? <laughs> we are going to be highlighting all of our wonderful delegates that won their primary, That's our right. new delegates. It's going to be a delegate um, cavalcade. Oh, Delhi. So every people that won candidates, so candidates, 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 sorry, candidates. candidates. And we're also will be talking, we'll start really, really uh, getting more into the summit because this is going to be integrated in. Buy a ticket for the summit. You won't be sorry. It's going to be a summer summit. And then also, of course, get your towel and cap because we got to make sure we look good. All right. Well, thank you for joining. Be a patron, support our show, like us on YouTube, Twitter, tweet at us. We want to know about what's going on with you today. And let's roll credits. Stay for the after chat if you want to chat around. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>